Oh, they got him. Good morning. Uh, some announcements this morning. Our weekly events are on this week, per the norm. Um, we're going to have our annual meeting right after the worship service. When I say right after, right after a couple cups of coffee, right after the service, we'll have our annual meeting. So there will be some time to visit and just spend some time together. And then we'll pull together, set up some tables, and begin that meeting. If you're a member of Pacific Coast Bible Church, I want to just encourage you, if you would, stick around for that meeting. If you're not a member of Pacific Coast Bible Church, just get out as fast as you can. No. <laughs> Honestly, that meeting is handy because um, reports are given from each category of ministry here at the church. And so it, it would really give you a good idea of kind of what's going on here. So if you want to stick around for that meeting, by all means, you are welcome to. Um, speaking of that, again, on the back wall, as I've shared for the numerous weeks, the uh, church officer nominees and the proposed budget are back there. Um, our new membership class is going to be next week and the week after, potentially three weeks, depending on how it speedily it goes. So that's going to be next Sunday during the Sunday school hour at the Bible Shack. So if you signed up for the new membership class during the Sunday school time at the Bible Shack, and that sign up is going to be down here if you haven't had the opportunity to sign up, you want to, or cross your name off of there. You, you're fit. Um... I believe that is what I have for today, and there's no youth group today. Yeah. So, let's pray. Lord, nowhere in your word can we find a reference that says you poured your love on us because you saw something good and worthy in us. In fact, your word with great clarity tells us there was nothing good in us and we were utterly unworthy. And yet, Father, we're going to sing songs and pray and read your word and spend time together all under the incredible umbrella of your eternal love that you have decided in and of yourself to pour on us. Father, I, I plead with you that that would flavor who we are, what we do, how we lead our lives. As we consider the incredible act of mercy and grace that's been poured out on us, Lord. And that our response, Father, would be that of joy, wonder, gratitude in the splendor of our salvation. And so, Lord, as we begin this service this morning, I pray you would remind each and every one of us, this is not a time for the people up here to perform for the people seated. No, Lord, we're here because we want to worship you. This is a worship service where we want to bring honor and glory, Father God, to your name. We want to please you. Your opinion matters the most. And so, dear God, I, I just thank you that you are progressively getting that through our thick skulls, that we are not here for us. We exist for the honor and glory and majesty of the creator of the universe. And dear God, I just want to express my heartfelt gratitude to you that I'm your son. And that by grace, I've been enabled to give glory to you in my life. Father, I pray that you be pleased in what's in the heart of your people in this building this morning. 
We do love you, Father. I pray that as we lift our voices in, in worship and honor to you, Father, truly, this would be a time of pure worship. That's only possible because I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. There is no good works apart from being under the blood of Jesus Christ. So maybe he be honored among his people today in Jesus' name. Would you please stand and join with me in singing, There is a Redeemer.
a congregation. <laughs> Would you please be seated for a call to worship? That sounds pretty serious. Can everybody sit down and such? Well, good morning to you all. This is our time for call to worship, which is interesting because we've been in worship mode since you woke up, hopefully. Uh, just looking out the window, just looking at your loved ones. Um, you know, we, we can worship God in, in so many ways and, and for even what we would call small things. But uh, they're not small things. This morning, I'm ready to just, just this last few weeks, just the, the power of God. Um, just, just think of all the, the miracles throughout the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament. Um, goodness, just, just, just let that... Let that distract you for a bit this morning. You know, that's, that's going to be okay. Don't be distracted when, when Dan's up here, but you can be distracted when I'm up here. And just, just let God, you know, distract you with the, the powerful things he has done. You know, I could say just recorded in scripture, um, but from time then till now, you know, they, they just continue. Um, yeah, just, just go ahead and, and let that happen. <laughs> So just think of these, these miracles throughout time when God demonstrates his power over his creation. And I want to say it again. When, when God demonstrates his power over his creation. Just, just, you know, this power really beyond our ability as creative beings, beyond our ability to imagine. You know, omnipotent. What, what a word. I mean, that's all powerful. Power beyond measure. Um, we do just, <laughs> just remember that He is God and we are not. Um, he is not under any authority but His own. The power of God. He is God. He answers to no one. <laughs> the power of God. Creation week. Uh, as we have uh, in Genesis 1. Absolutely full of miracles. I mean, every day. <clears throat> These were miracles. These are not things that, that went through uh, processes. These are not things that follow what we would call natural law. God operates outside of that. These were absolute miracles every day. Creating everything out of nothing can only be called a miracle. Everything out of nothing. In Creation Week, this maybe is a little quiz for you. Um, think of the first creation miracle recorded in Scripture. The very first. Let's start thinking about that. Genesis 1, a good place to start. Chapter 1, and then start reading. In the beginning. beginning. The first created miracle in the beginning. When God gave the universe a beginning, he created time itself. Really, the clock started ticking. That's the starting point. For our, our known universe. Eternity past, we can't measure that because time didn't exist. Time and space were created by him to govern his creation. He has no need of time or space. He's not bound by time or space. The absolute miracle of creation is proof of this. In the beginning, God created. So with all of this, he alone is worthy of our worship. He alone is worthy of our praise. He alone is worthy of our adoration. And remember, he answers to no one. No one. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, But God, but our God is in the heavens. I love this. He does whatever he pleases. <laughs> Psalm 90 verse 2 as before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. It just, it's, it's hard to know where, where, to, where to start, where to stop, and, and where to continue in any of this, but God's power. Um, I want to read Psalm 96, which is interestingly uh, captioned as a call to worship, which is what we're doing. A call to worship the Lord, the righteous judge. 
Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come unto his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established and it will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and his peoples in his faithfulness he will judge. So let us continue our worship of our great and mighty sovereign king of the universe. And allow yourself in everything that you see and every opportunity you can get to be in absolute awe of who God is. Let's pray together. Oh Lord God, you are our God, and we will ever praise you. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Nothing is too difficult for you. Thank you, O oh God, for your gift of grace that allows us to worship you. And we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Please stand again and join with us and continue our worship and Lord I need you. Yeah. 
take time to be holy. some markings in there, but um, this book is extra special to me. My, my grandfather took hundreds, he was a, a pastor, took hundreds of men through the study of this particular book, and it was one that he just, every time they go on vacation and visit, this was a book he had with them and just chewed on and chewed on. So, the person here who last watched a John Wayne movie gets the book. <laughs> Ladies? Any? <laughs> Who watched a John Wayne movie last? Mitch? <laughs> Serious? Like when? Captain Hepburn was in it. Like Thursday? Thursday. <laughs> Somebody better be able to beat Thursday. <laughs> Come on. Then. Good work, Elder. Man. I love men. I'm proud of him. Good work, pal. All right. We'll do homework next week. Um, so, Genesis chapter 23. If you have your Bible with you, turn with me to Genesis chapter 23. If you don't happen to have a Bible and you'd like one, um, just raise your hand and we'll get one to you. <clears throat> Genesis 23. We're going to go through the whole chapter, but I'm just going to read the first three verses and then... Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah, and Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her.
And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Father, I pray that your blessing would be on this time of study. Um, I pray, Father God, that you would help me to stay out of the way of your doing here. And uh, as your spirit takes your word and sows it into the heart of your people, I ask God that, that I would be um, a conduit that does not stop that process, but can be used uh, by you for your glory and, and Father, for the encouragement of your, of your church. It is a blessed privilege that I am unworthy of and inadequate to do. So I, I just plead with you, Father, that you would use me and that I would not be a distraction or get in the way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> so I was roughly 17 or 18 when I started to sense, whatever that means, a calling to become a pastor or I, I wanted to do it. There was something in my heart that was growing, and um, my pastor was one of the pivotal uh, people in my life that I looked up to, thought very highly of, and my youth pastor had a huge impact as well. And so I started talking with people and visiting with people, and there was a lot of warning. There was a lot of preparation, a lot of concern in some, because you're only 18 years old, so on and so forth, uh, which was all good and true and right. But I did it anyways, because <laughs> I, I truly believed I was supposed to. Um, went to Bible school, went through all those different pieces to the puzzle that needed to be done. There was a category that I did not have a clue would be such a large category of this life. I didn't know that this would be such an important piece. I didn't know that I would see so much of it. And I have been very surprised in the last 16 years how much death the Lord has allowed into my life and put me in, in the path of that. Um, you know, you guys know I'm a chaplain of the sheriff's office. I, I, that wasn't on the radar when I wanted to become a pastor. Had no idea that that was going to be a thing. And I didn't know how often, you know, everybody said, well, you, are you ready to marry and bury and those kinds of little cliche things? And yeah, I guess, sure. I, I want to go serve. That's what I want to go do. But I, I didn't have a clue about the weight of how much I would see and how painful it would be to watch, <clears throat> to watch others in pain and, and, and feel you know, you stay in a congregation for a while, you, you grow to love them, they become family, and then you watch them endure pain. Well, you, you, you aren't unfeeling, you can't not feel what they're feeling, and so that pain hits you. So I've embraced the concept that God has called me to be somebody who is involved in, in the lives of people who are in the midst of death. I don't... Um, uh, I'm not upset about that. I, I'm not angry at the Lord that that's part of my calling. I, I embrace it, that that's what the Lord wants me to do. But since I've embraced it, i got to tell you, it is quite interesting to me how much our culture tries to hide the fact that everybody in this room, apart from the Lord's return, will die. And we have beauty creams and all kinds of things in this world to make sure we still look and feel young. Well, newsflash, <clears throat> we're all getting older. Everybody in this room is getting older. Everybody in this room is on your way to death. Now, what an encouragement, Dan. <laughs> but I will say, hear me out. Hear me out on this one. By the end of this message, perhaps that statement that we're all closer to death is not discouraging. It's just hear me out. So we're hearing this passage, and we have been hearing for weeks, for months and months and months about Abraham 
and his wife Sarah and all the promises God's made them and the promise of a child and the fulfillment of that promise, their growth in godliness, the sweetness of their relationship with the Lord, um, some mistakes they've made, the bumpy path, all of this stuff. And now it's the end of at least the earthly story for this woman. If you look back at uh, verse 20 of 22, we get a little bit about the relatives of Abraham. It's interesting, we get more of a family category about this man, more than we have throughout this, because now we're going to be told about his relatives, his wife's death, and then we get to 24, we're going to a wedding for his son. If you look at verse 20, I'm not going to do an exposition of 20 through 24. It's just kind of an explanation of what's taking place with relatives of Abraham. It says, now after these things, I was told, I was told to, it was told to Abraham, behold, Micah, Milcah also, you know what, let me put on my glasses. <laughs> We're all getting older. Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. Uz, his firstborn, Buzz, his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Chezid, Hasso, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel, Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Remhah, <clears throat> bore Tabah, Gaham, Tehash, and Maacah. Now, what's funny is, as I pronounce that all week, I show up and I say it differently than you. Because so, <clears throat> you kind of, fascinating, isn't it? Back in chapter 12, he calls Abraham and he says, I want you to leave your country, I want you to go to a country that I'm going to show you. Well, what about his relatives? Well, this gives a little bit more insight that there is still a continuation there with the relatives of Abraham. Now, then we come to verse 1 of 23. Sarah lived 127 years. You're hard-pressed to find anywhere else in Scripture where the age of a woman is given, specifically the age of the woman who dies. It's just not there. Um, you won't see that. But it's vitally important and significant to who this particular woman is, thinking of this as a woman who bore the child of promise. Now, I want you to think carefully with me, okay? And I'm going to move kind of quickly through this chapter, um, but there's just a meeting after this, so we got lots of time. Sarah, who is Sarah? Sarah is a believer in God's promises. Hebrews 11, 11, we're told that this woman also believed the promises of God. This is a woman of faith. This is a believer. This is one who, alongside Abraham, is looking forward to the promised child that God had said they would have. She's an example to the ages. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. I only have a few extra texts in this sermon, um, but they're, they're important here, and they, they really paint a better picture. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. And what I'm drawing to your attention here, if I can find it, is that Sarah is given as exemplary. Sarah is given as an example. I'll pick it up at verse 4. Speaking to the women, it says, But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women, notice that, that definition, that term, this holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Well, what exhibit from the Old Testament does he go to, under the inspiration of the Spirit, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord? And you are her children, meaning you walk in the same path as Sarah, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. And so all the way with the Apostle Peter, as he's writing under the inspiration of the Spirit, who could I give as, an, as exemplary, as an example of what a godly woman should be? Sarah is the one who's given. She was a beloved longtime mate to Abraham, year after year after year after year. Some of those years harder than others. Some of those years perhaps irritating and frustrating than others because of the waiting for Isaac. I'm waiting for the promise of the Lord. Well, Abraham's not waiting alone. He's waiting in the presence of this woman who has now died. 
She's also the mother of the promised child. And she's also the mother who will give birth to Isaac and eventually will go all the way down the line to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a pivotal character in redemptive history. Not just a pivotal character in your Bible, yes, but a pivotal character in the salvation you have. Sarah is a, is a uh, blip on the screen of God's plan of redemption, ultimately resulting in Christ's death. She's a very, very important figure. Sarah, like Abraham, had been growing in her faith through all these years of joys and trials. As you think about everything that has been encountered with Abraham and Sarah, and now at 127 years, the Lord says, you're done. I'm taking it now. I'm taking you now. This earth is no longer your home. It's over. Your work is done. <clears throat> If you look down at your Bibles, we're told that Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that's Hebron, in the land of Canaan. This promised land, they go there and she dies in Canaan. <clears throat> the first patriarch, patriarchal family, the first one in that line, to die in the land of Canaan. And we're told that Abraham mourned over her. You'll be hard-pressed to find in Genesis thus far somebody crying. If you, search the old, if you search the book of Genesis up through chapter 23, you'll, have, you'll be very hard-pressed to find it where it's described somebody's tears, even especially the tears of a man. Yet the scripture tells us very plainly, very clearly right here, at the loss of this woman, he went and mourned. Uh, look down at your Bible, it says, Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Death is a result from sin. Okay, just follow with me on, on this little track. Death is a result of sin. Death is painful. Not only for the person that's dying at times, but emotionally, deeply painful for those who have to watch and embrace the reality they just left this earth. And death is a reminder of so much theological truth. Death is a reminder of theological truth. The fall takes us all the way back to the fall in chapter 3. Death should remind you of that. The curse that all people are dead in Adam, their bodies decaying, they're moving towards death because of that fall. Redemption, it was through death that we are redeemed, through the Lord Jesus Christ. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection... Beloved, when death is present, it is a slap across the face that there is something far greater, far more eternal that we should be thinking about. Painful, yes. A result of sin, yes. But a reminder of truth at the same time. Death is something that all of us live with all of us see, all of us are headed towards, apart from the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't get away from it. And so the, the funny little game of hiding yourself from death and concealing it in our culture, so that way we feel as if there is no eternity, is absolutely ridiculous. And it's a lie. The truth of eternal life does not remove the, the deep pain of death. Now, this is what I, I want to touch on really quick, and I'll get more to this at, towards the end of this message. It's always bothered me, personally, just a bit, when I hear a Christian try to stop another Christian in their pain or in their tears in the moment of losing somebody. You shouldn't be crying. You should be happy. Jesus died. There, there's a time of resurrection and everything's going to be okay. Don't, don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. Now, that may be in their mind some sort of comfort, but let me just say, beloved, biblically, mourning the death of a loved one is right, good, biblical, and healthy for you. 
And it's just, it's just kind of silly when we want to stop somebody from doing what God has designed for them to do in that moment in a reaction to that specific thing that's taken place. Some of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life were said right after somebody died. Things that should never have been said. God needed another angel in heaven and he took yours. Oh, stop, stop. <laughs> Please, just leave the room. But it's just because folks don't know what to say. Because death is something that's hidden from us. We're not in it as much as maybe we should be biblically. And probably, I will say, not as much as we did at one point, even in this country, where death was a part of our culture. Um, I won't go any further than that. Now, if you look down at your Bibles, this is kind of fascinating to me where we transition from this. We go from tears in his eyes, running down his cheeks, and his heart breaking, to bartering. <laughs> we go immediately from there to a place of burial for this wife of his, which, you know, that's not that far off the beaten path. That, that happens at some point. Um, I will tell you this, what I have seen many times in the presence when somebody has died and you're there with the loved ones, they need a task to help get them pushed through with a little bit more ease from the pain. They, a little bit of work is not a bad thing. A task is a good thing. There's been times where I've been there and somebody goes, after they've, they've really poured their, their eyes out, they'll say, oh, well, Dan, can I make some coffee for you? Can I get a sandwich for you? And you know how I am. Yes. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. I may not be hungry, but yes. But I've learned a couple things in that the, our natural reaction is, oh, no, no, no. You, you don't do that. You let me serve you. So let me just say this for future reference. If you ever see me in that scenario and you see me go, yeah, and matter of fact, do you have any chips? And just start pushing them for, you know, my car needs washed. It, the, the concept is very simple. That task is actually extremely helpful to those people in the midst of that pain. I don't know about you, but if I have a task in the midst of pain, it's very helpful. Um, so it doesn't strike me that weird that the next thing Abraham does after pouring out his mourning, his tears over his beloved wife, I have a task in front of me now. I need to purchase a piece of property where I can bury my beloved. And so look down at your Bible, verse 4. <clears throat> so he goes to the Hittites and he says, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, if you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field for the full price. Let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now, commentaries dis differ here a little bit. Commentators, I should say, differ with one another here on the genuineness or lack thereof of the Hittites and how they're dealing with Abraham here. <coughs> so, you ever been there where there's a salesman that becomes your best friend within about three minutes? <laughs> right? Because there's a goal. There's a purpose here. Um, you know, are they going to invite you to their birthday? Probably not, but they might make a sale. So... As you visit with them, they become your friends. That's what uh, some folks see the Hittites' actions here. And I think there's some points that make some sense about that. Number one, they schmooze him right off the bat. Oh, Lord, another way of sir, it's a term of respect. But then they go so far as to say, you're a prince of God among us. Whatever, whatever you want is yours. So the argument, you guys, from some commentators is that what they're doing here is they're bluffing. Anything you want is, is yours. 
But they're not really planning that. They're not really intending on that. Their intention is to sell him something eventually, which they do. And as we go further in this, you'll, you'll see that. So they say, anything that you want, any tomb that you want is yours. Now, I find it fascinating. Abraham is a sojourner. He calls himself a sojourner, calls himself basically an outsider. I'm a foreigner, and yet I want to purchase a piece of land here. Intentionally, I believe, the Lord has a plan there. Now, as we know from Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham saw himself as a sojourner here, particularly in two ways. Number one, the land of Canaan, he's not from there. But number two, this earth's not his home. He's looking for a, 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 a tent not made by hands. He's looking for an eternal resting place. And so I'm curious, and I don't know from the text, whether Abraham means foreigner, as in I'm a foreigner to you, or I'm a foreigner to this world. But both are true. And so Abraham's request is, I need a place, I want a place on this land, this promised land God has brought me to, to bury my wife. And then he's apparently scoped out a spot already. Because he, and he knows who owns it? This guy's done a little bit of homework. Um, they say, we'll give you any tomb. Really? Well, I've got a tomb in mind, which is what you do, by the way, sidebar. If you're going to go buy a car, go knowing what you want and how much it should cost, right? And then when you show up, you, you go too, because they're going to show you a bunch of different cars. Abraham says, there's a field over here, there's a particular cave over here, and I wish to buy that one from Ephron, one of the Hittites. Now, look down at, at your Bible. I ended at verse 9. Verse 10. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites. Very important. There's witnesses to this that's taking place. They're hearing all that's being done of all who went in at the gate of this city. So, or his city. There's a large gathering here. Folks are in the presence. They're hearing what's happening. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field. And I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. The next move on Abraham's part is very telling about this man's character. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. They said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will hear me, I give the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. I find that interesting about this man because what I've sought to do in, the, in this brief series um, going through specifically this portion of Abraham's life is, guys, the more I've studied it, the more I've looked at it, the more the text shows Abraham is growing in godliness. He's growing in faith. The illustration I've given week after week after week is the lens is getting bigger for this man. This man is seeing God more and more and more. He's maturing. He's growing in his godliness. He's growing in his understanding of his God. And isn't it interesting that as this guy has gone through turmoil, difficulty, but also seen the promises fulfilled, saw the birth of Isaac, he's held Isaac, he's seen this, and then called to sacrifice, and he doesn't sacrifice, and God provides. He's learned of his God. He knows his God. And so here we are. All these people are saying, just take the land, just take the land. And he finds himself bowing in utter, maybe a small word or lack of a better word, courtesy to these men. And in humility before God and in humility before man, he says, if you will, I want to pay for it and own this land before all these people. I don't know about you, but the more I study this man, Abraham, is a different guy in 23 than was in 12. And why would we be surprised by that? You should be different than you were when you got born again. God's at work in him. God's changed him. God's grown him. So down at 14, Ephron answered Abraham, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. I find that so fascinating, okay? It's, picture this. Picture that I, I decide to give Dennis Chris a brand new guitar, okay? And I, I go and I buy him, uh, 
He's already got a Martin, so it's going to have to be a Taylor. I buy him a new Taylor guitar, and I present that to Dennis. And Dennis goes, Dan, this is over the top. How could you give me this Taylor guitar? And I say, Dennis, what's a $1,495 guitar between friends? <laughs> I just find it very interesting in the text that Ephron says, what is the, and then just gives the exact price between us. So, this is why the commentators are differing with one another. They either A, he's totally genuine and he's just dumb, or B, he is dropping a hint because he really does intend to make a, pro make a profit off of Abraham. You be the judge. I don't know, and I don't really care, because the text is not about Ephron's character, it's about Abraham's character, in my opinion. And most commentators agreed in my study that... Um, that, was, that price was rather large for the piece of land that he was trying to sell for. So this is the point where Abraham goes, what are you kidding me? And then makes a counteroffer, right? That's what you do next. He makes an offer, it's too big, Abraham comes back with a different offer, and then all of a sudden we're in this back and forth business. Rather, Abraham, in interesting humility, politeness, and gentleness, Abraham listened to Ephraim. And Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites. <laughs> Please notice the language here. He named it in the hearing of the Hittites and in the hearing of Abraham. Everybody there knows what he wants price-wise. 400 shekels of silver according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Remember, beloved, God doesn't waste ink. There's a reason it keeps repetitive, repet, repeatedly saying this over and over and over. It's designating this spot on purpose. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. Sarah is buried in this location. Turn to Genesis 25. Genesis chapter 25, verse 9. And I'm, we're going to be looking at a, a, a handful of verses here in the book of Genesis. Genesis 25, verse 9. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. Genesis 35. Genesis chapter 35, verse 27. 35, 27. And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last, and he died, and was gathered to his people, old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Again, the same location. Genesis 49. Genesis chapter 49. I think you see where we're going with this. <clears throat> Verse 30. Genesis 49, 30. Pick it up at 29. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field <clears throat> from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. And then Genesis 50, verse 13. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave at the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. After he buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt 
with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. There is a remarkable historical marking place here. This, this marker of where the, patriarch, the patriarchal line, or many of the patriarchs, are all gathered up in this same location. Now, here's where I want to take you. And this was the part of the study that has gripped my heart quite a bit. How does a Christian respond to death? <coughs> How do you respond? How, how, how should we respond to death? Not necessarily our death per se, but that's a part of it. But in general, the reality that every last person in this building, apart from the Lord's return, will die. But before that, we will mourn the death of others, most likely. How does, what is a Christian's attitude towards death? What is interesting to me is throughout this passage in Genesis chapter 23 and the death of Sarah, I believe Abraham is a beautiful example of a, of a believer's response to death. Here's some things that I see in Abraham exemplified. A deep love that, he, that does not get altered for this woman. I think it's clear from the text he absolutely loved her and was committed to her. But the second is an absolute trust in God. The Lord's taken her. We don't just see this from Abraham. We see this throughout Scripture. A, a believer, uh, when the Lord takes somebody, they, they are, are hurt and wounded and sad and, and hit by that, but they still recognize it is God who's decided this. The Scripture says you cannot add a day to your span of life. The Lord is the one who's measured our time. The Lord's the one who's measured our days. He's the one who's in charge of that. So, in a sense, in your anger at death, perhaps, he's the one you should be talking to. Because there's still, God's sovereignty doesn't go up to death and then stop. It's in the midst of that as well. And I could argue that from so many pages of the word, I'm not going to. I just show you over and over, specifically in the Psalms, in reference to the Lord's sovereignty in the taking of his people. Then we're actually told in Psalm 116 that it's blessed in the eyes of the Lord when the saints die. But I also saw in Abraham not an anger, not a, not a, a rage type thing. I've seen that before with folks. But a humility a calmness and a gentleness in dealing with other people and dealing with, this, with the reality that his wife had died. But above all that, what's the capstone on that, what I think alters everything for you and for me in reference to the death of somebody, is living life with an eternal perspective. Living life actually thinking about eternity. Not just this life. Now, beloved, please don't misunderstand me on this, okay? I, I'm not being cold and heartless saying, therefore, we shouldn't mourn. It's all over the scripture to mourn. This is an enemy. Death is a result of sin. And we should mourn the loss of somebody. We should mourn that death. But in the midst of that, there is um, a, a term that I picked up from Dennis over the years. There's a quiet confidence where... You're not angry, you're not rageful, you're not running around like a chicken with its head cut off. What you're doing is you find such a stability and calming in God in the midst of that moment. Now, real quick, does that remove all the yeah buts? And does that remove all of the God whys? No, I know that. You know that. You've been in the midst of difficulty. We all know that in the midst of that, we still go, but I don't know why he did it. No, but do you trust him? Do you trust him with your why? It's one of the most important, fundamental, pivotal reasons we gather here, in my opinion, beloved, is that we're gathering here to have that trust. So even though God says, no, I'm not giving you the why, we can somehow find a sense of confidence in the one who's in charge. So I can say, Lord, it's okay if I don't know the why. I'm all right. 
If I can't see around the corner, it's still okay, because I know I can trust you. I'm not a guy that closes his eyes too well when somebody else is driving. I don't trust them. Now, I say that, and you should also know that I sleep like a baby when my wife drives, because she's a better driver than I am. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, like you didn't know that. <clears throat> I don't trust easily. I never have. But beloved, the more I see in the word, the God of the word, the God of history, the God of sovereignty, the God of absolute precision, I believe that by his grace, I'm growing to say, it's all right if I don't know. Because he knows. And I know the one who does know. So I can relax in him. Not relax in my knowledge of what's coming up, but knowledge of the one who's in charge of what's coming up. So what I see in Abraham is this guy has been walking with God for so many years. His wife at 127 years old has just died. And he has seen God faithful in so many ways that he's unmoved in the sense of questioning God at the loss of a loved one. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll close out here. Well, we'll almost close out here. i got one more after that. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9 is where I want us to go real quick. Because the question I'm talking, what I'm touching on here, guys, is the attitude, the mindset, the confidence of this man. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9. We'll pick it up at 8 and put the whole thing together. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Why? And I hope, you guys, that this is the truth for you. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. She considered God faithful. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they'd been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. I love that language. That is... A heavenly one. Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared for them a city. I am convinced the, the deeper rooted we are in the truth of our eternal resting place, the more death does not have that grip that it has on our world right now. Mourn, yes. Um, impacted, yes. Fearful of the future, becoming less and less. So, I already said it, but last passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Should be very familiar to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. This is in reference to the dead. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. 
For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven and with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive are are left who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will what's the word what's the next word if there's a word in there to underline what a word to underline we will always be with the Lord and then here's the charge therefore encourage one another with these words Guys, we can look death in the face with a response of hope, knowing who we are, whose we are, and what we are going towards. So let me just finish on this note. One of the hardest places to be is in the presence of death of somebody who has rejected the Lord Jesus. And to know they're in wrath that is unquenchable for all eternity. It makes all the difference in the world to look in the face of somebody crying and they make this statement, I know where they are. And I'll know, I know I'll be with them in the presence of Christ forever. As opposed to somebody who says, I don't know what to do. With no grasp of eternity, no concept of where that person is, and no concept of where their own soul would be if they died that day. So I challenge you, again, if you're playing church, if you don't know Christ, if deep in your heart you know this isn't true for me, this isn't true, can I just challenge you to consider the cost? Just, just consider the reality of your own soul. And when the Lord does decide to take your life, that you'd be in his presence. And beloved, you who are in Christ, may we walk in this life, not in arrogance, but in a quiet confidence that my eternal resting place is in joy everlasting that cannot be touched because of the work of the sovereign God. That's how the church responds to death. That's how they respond to this thing that the world is fleeing from as much as it can. I'm of the opinion it's actually one of the best places in this world for a Christian to shine the light of the Lord Jesus Christ when the world has no hope because they're faced with it. They're faced with eternity. Not that we're boorish and rude in that moment, but that we find opportunities to shine the glorious light of salvation in the midst of the deepest pain of this, this world experiences. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for PCBC. And Father, the immense amount of examples that I have seen in the years of being here. Lord, watching Christians face their own mortality or the mortality of their spouse, the mortality of their children, the mortality of their parents, and responded with mourning, responded with tears, but Lord, simultaneously responding in hope, the one glorious hope that is only available through you. And I just, I thank you, Father, for how my life has been shaped by watching your people respond to difficulty. 
And I pray, Father God, that you would deeply root this church, these Christians in this gathering here, you deeply root us in the truth of your word that, dear God, an eternal perspective would flavor everything we come in contact with. And as we push it through that grid, Father, we find ourselves profoundly stabilize because we trust the one in charge of the future even though we don't know what the future is so lord i pray you'd give some extra strength you would boost the faith of this body for lord who knows who knows apart from you who knows what 2022 has got in front of us so father may we not waste time but now's the time Now's the time to know our God in a deeper, more profound way than we have ever before. So pray for your blessing on this body, Lord God. The blessing of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dan. Would you please rise and join with us in singing holy, holy, holy to our Savior and Lord. <laughs>